Good morning, Living Church and Faith Family at Berean. It's great to have you with us to worship this morning. We are looking at a series, this is the last one in the series, called Mixtape. It's all the different musical styles that we find in the Psalms. The Old Testament book of the Psalms, which were songs written in different styles for different occasions with different voices and different content. And today we come to Psalm 116. This psalm has special meaning for me, as you will come to know by the end of this message. But if you're able to, I'd like for you to stand as we read this psalm. And those of you in the overflow, you can stand with us. Psalm 116. I love the Lord because He has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because He inclined His ear to me, therefore I will call on Him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me, the pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, He saved me. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all His benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all His people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. O Lord, I am Your servant. I am Your servant, the son of Your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to You the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all His people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in Your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank You for this word. Thank you for what it reveals about who you are and your character. And thank you that it teaches us today what we need to know to live a life that is full and complete. Now teach us by your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I well remember the adrenaline days of ministry. When God was calling me out as a young man at the age of 21, and motivating me with outside adventure, with the physical challenges of a young camp that I was working with. It was called Sea and Summit. And we took delinquent boys from the camps of California and took them on 21-day expeditions. We trained them for a week at sea level, and then we took them for a 14-day expedition to the high Sierras, where we starved on tuna fish and freeze-dried food. It was quite an adventure to get these young men to trust, to trust one another, to trust us, to learn to rely on each other. So we taught them by using mountain climbing skills, and we put them at some degree of risk. At least they thought it was risky, but it was also safe. We taught them under a certain degree of stress. We wanted to, to do this to teach them to trust us, and ultimately, we wanted to introduce them to the man of all men, who is Jesus. But we would take them to the Sierras, and there was our, the main goal in mind in the Sierras was to climb a couple of mountains. And so we would hike in several days and fight the mosquitoes and make camp, and finally we would make our way to the top of a mountain, and there at that summit, there would be great joy and celebration. Have you ever been to the summit of a mountain? It's a, it's a great experience. We had high fives and talk smack, and everybody was joyful at the top of this mountain. These boys were from Pasadena and the, the barrios of Los Angeles and Bakersfield and Oakland, and they'd never been past a freeway, and they were so excited to be on this summit. But something else happened there. Worship happened there. Not hymns and, and prayers, but it was that, that silent awe, that grandeur and wonder, that hundred-mile gaze. Have you been to a summit? Not only is being there something wonderful, but you see from there so many things you'd never seen before. 
that 360 degree gaze just brought out of them this need to worship. They, they pointed, they gawked, they looked, they saw, and we would spend a couple of hours there on that summit. There's nothing like the summit as an experience. Well, if there's any thing that we quest for, if there's any pinnacle we look for in our human experience, every person here, every person within the sound of my voice, every person on the globe seeks the summit experience of love because love is the summit of personal experience. Love is that place where you sense that joy and celebration and that well-being, but it's also the place from which you see everything else differently. When you're at the summit, the hike was worth it. When you're at the summit, you see everything lying before you with a different perspective. The next journey is worth it as well. And the summit of our human experience is to love and to be loved. This is what we all desire. It's what we all want. But what more can we say about love because we're awash in words of love. We're awash in it in all of our media, all of our All of our radio stations, our playlists, that's from the oldies to the top 40, from jazz to pop to to hip-hop to country to big band, we all talk about love. But what is love really? It's the most shape-shifting word in our vocabulary. At one time, we'll use love to motivate us to give to earthquake victims or to march against injustice. And then the next minute, we'll use love to justify our own selfishness or our lack of self-control because love made me do it. Love is this, this word that we don't quite understand, and it's random and dangerous, it seems like, because I can fall into it, I can trip over it, I can fall out of it. It breaks my heart. It renders me helpless. It makes me stupid. It can't be good for your health because it makes my knees weak, my heart pound, my hands sweat, my head spin, and my eyes misty. That's what love is. So now we come to another love song. And what are we to make of this love song to the Lord when our minds are so filled with different illusions about love? Psalm 116 verse 1 says, I love the Lord. What does that mean? Well, the love that he's talking about here not only changed his temporary emotions, not only did it affect his circumstances, but it changed his attitude. It changed his outlook. It gave him a lifetime motivation that never changed. And he never got over what this love did to him. That's what he sings about. And we can discover this love here in this psalm and in many other places in Scripture And you can experience it as well. So let's begin by recognizing love. What is love? Here's a question for you. What do the Bible and pop culture totally agree about? The Bible and and pop culture totally agree that love is the most important thing. Maybe another way to ask it is, what does John Lennon and the Apostle John agree about? All you need is love is what Lennon said and the Apostle John said, God is love. But oh, the confusion that we have about what love looks like. Now, there's a warning in this next segment here because I'm going to ruin a lot of love songs for you. But a lot of this message is further embedded in our hearts than we realize. When we listen to the jealousy and possessiveness and codependency of a lot of our love songs, it's amazing what we have come to repeat and expect. Michael Bolton, how am I supposed to live without you? How am I supposed to carry on when all that I've been living for is gone? Nilsson says, I can't live if living is without you. Let's make it intergenerational. Frank Sinatra Why not take all of me? I'm no good without you. Take my arms. I'll never use them. I'm just a mess without you. You took the best. Why not take the rest? This is the musical version of that commercial. I've fallen and I can't get up. That's what love has done to me. How about this nice little tune from the Beatles? Well, I'd rather see you dead, little girl, 
than to be with another man. Better run for your life if you can, little girl. Catch you with another man, that's the end. Nazareth says, love hurts, love scars, love wounds, and love mars. And who could forget Marvin Gaye? Losing you would end my life, you see, because you mean that much to me. And not to leave our country friends out, they said, I'm so miserable without you, it's almost like having you here. (laughs) All right, let's not go there, all right? (laughs) Now, you might not believe any of this when you see it written out. This is more about toxic dependency and obsessive narcissism. This is about control. It's not the kind of love we're talking about in Psalm 116. But we are swimming in this all the time. And how much does that affect what I believe that I'm looking for when I'm looking for that summit experience called love? Christian counselor Larry Crabb said that when we base love on, ro- on romantic love, romantic attraction, it's like a tick on a dog relationship. It's a hungry parasite looking for a nourishing host to suck life out of. He says the only problem with this is that six months into that kind of a marriage, we have two ticks and no dog. How many of us have been disappointed with love because we didn't even recognize what real love is? That brings us to the psalm. Psalm 116, verse 1. I want to just read the first five verses again. I love the Lord because He has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. Notice a couple of things here. Number one, it starts out saying, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. When the ESV, the English Standard Version, has the Lord in all caps, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that signifies we're talking about His name. This is not the concept of the Almighty. It's not a philosophical construct called the benevolence. No, this is God's name. This is the name that Moses received at the burning bush when he kicked off his sandals and stood on holy ground, and God called him, and Moses said, who should I say sent me? And God said, tell them that I am has sent you. That's what we see when we see the Lord. That's his name. So this is your name carved in a tree and the Lord's name carved in a tree with a heart carved around it. It's very specific. I love the Lord because He's a person. It's I and thou. It's you and me. This is who I love. I love the Lord. It's not an idea. It's a song to a person that we're talking about here. Notice also that it's very personal. Thirty-four times in this psalm, the first person pronoun or its possessive is used. I, me, mine. Not because he's selfish, but because he is pouring out his soul to God. This is very personal. I love the Lord because he heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. And notice what he talks about here. As as he talks about this love song to the Lord, it's because. Probably the most important word in this psalm, for me, is the word because. The psalmist ends up, look at the end of verse 2, I will call on him as long as I live. This is a lifelong motivation that's been implanted in the psalmist. Why? Because. There's a big, bold because. I love the Lord because. Look what it says. He heard my voice. 
He heard my pleas for mercy. He inclined his ear toward me. Many of you mothers, when you're walking through a mall, you know what this like is like, and your child says something, you can't quite hear them, so you stop what you're doing, and you incline your ear. You bend down. You stop what you're doing because it's important to hear that voice. Do you know that you have a voice with God? It's not children should be seen and not heard. It's not, well, don't bother me until you've got something important to say. No, the Lord inclined his ear. He condescended to my level. He actively, quietly listened to what I had to say. And it wasn't nice. It was a plea for mercy. I was helpless and hopeless. And the Lord heard my voice. I love the Lord because... And don't miss the result. Because of what He has done, I will call on Him as long as I live. And it's all started and sustained by that word, because. Way at the other end of the Bible, 1 John 4, 19. We love because He first loved us. There's no such thing as an uncaused cause. Many of us have loved because we thought that person was going to love us back or because we thought the, the pursuit would give a reward or because we thought we'd get something in return and we've been disappointed and disappointed and disappointed and so we said, well, love doesn't work. Well, here's where love begins. I love because I am loved. Loved by one who knows everything about me. He doesn't have to do anything. He simply sought me out and loved me because he loved me. And here's the way he loved me. And it describes more trouble, the pangs, the snares, the fears, the suffering, the worry, the torment. Have you known that? Of course you have. And look at verse 5. The very first word that describes the character of God is gracious. Not scolding not blaming, not fearful, not rejecting, not giving you a do list, not telling you to shape up or you wouldn't be in this trouble. And we have some major unlearning to do about recognizing love. Because frankly, many of us have our because in the wrong place. And it's come from our families of origin. It's come from the way we were raised. I want to read to you something that may be very painful for some of you. Because this is what normal looked like. This is what you grew up thinking love looked like. This is what you grew up thinking, I need to do this because if I don't do this, I won't be loved. This is uh, Sandra Wilson's 10 Rules for Children in Dysfunctional Homes, where parents are distracted and they really can't handle normal humans, <laughs> but they want their children to be perfect. So here are the 10 rules. A good child, a perfect child, never inconveniences a parent, never embarrasses or disappoints a parent, never has any personal needs, knows how to do everything perfectly without being taught, never loses except when competing with a parent, never has a critical or separate thought, never gets anything but an A in every class, thrives on chaos, instability, and pain. Does everything parents ask instantly, joyfully, and perfectly the first time and never remembers anything but the happy times? This kind of experience front loads us to be performers, to be pleasers, to do everything we need to do because if we don't, we will lose love and we've got the because in the wrong place. The psalmist says, I was miserable. I wasn't performing. I had nothing to give. I was hopeless. And I love the Lord because He loved me in that place. He found me there. We have some major learning and major unlearning to do, but this is how we recognize love. Well, let's talk then about receiving love. What qualifies me to be loved? What do I need to have on my resume to be loved? Look at verses 6 through 9. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, He saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. 
For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Do you notice any muscular, proactive verbs there or descriptions? Any adjectives of a person that are, that are worthy to be sought after? No, here are the words. Simple, low, death, tears, stumbling. And what we see here are words of humility and surrender and acceptance and relief. Look at verse 6. The Lord preserves the simple. That is not a derogatory term. To be simple is not blameworthy. It's not a moral failing to be simple. To be simple means I simply haven't been taught. To be simple is I don't have the knowledge. To be simple is to be open to being instructed because I don't know. I don't know who, I don't know how, I don't know when. And the psalmist was in a place of trouble, and he simply became simple, which means humble. Lord, I need a master to teach me here. Notice some other words that describe him. You have dealt bountifully with me, generously. How many times in Scripture does it say, according to his riches of mercy, out of the abundance of his grace, the Lord has dealt bountifully with us, not sparely or stingily, but bountifully and generously. He's rescued me. He's delivered me. These are the words of the helpless, the forgotten, the lost, who simply needed to receive the rescuer. Now, the proof of this is verses 10 and 11. I believed when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. He said, I can't help myself. Verse 11 said, I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. Nobody else is coming either. But the Lord is coming. The Lord rescued me. The Lord loved me. He found me. He picked me up, and He loved me. And I love the Lord because I recognize His love, and I received His love. What is the result of recognizing that love is real and receiving that love solely because it's offered and given to us? I think a story will help us internalize this. Let's watch the screen. What happens when you know your life has been made possible by someone's love? What happens when you know that you had a debt you couldn't pay and someone paid it for you? What happens when you recognize love and you receive that love is you become a responder to that love. You now begin to not live a life of deficit but a life of fullness because it's poured in, it can be poured out, and you begin responding to love as it ought to be. That brings us to verse 12 through 14 of Psalm 116. And it's really the reason why I chose this psalm. What shall I render to the Lord for all His benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all His people. I want to conclude today with a story which I believe exegetes these verses, that despite all that happens in life and despite all the trouble that can take place, that love responds by giving of itself. This past June 5th, my father passed away. He was 94 years old, and uh, he was ready to meet the Lord. We had been praying that God's mercy would, would take him and graduate him. And, of course, there's a lot of sadness involved with that and many emotions and then lots of reflection, lots of memories come flooding back. But I was able to preach on, at his memorial service this summer, and I used this text, Psalm 116, verses 12 through 14, because my, this is really a short biography of my, of my dad's life. And I had the privilege as a son to watch and hear a love song to the Lord sung for an entire life, a 94-year-long life. Let me tell you a little bit about my dad. 
And there are others like him, but I know him better than anybody else that I know that is like him. He was born in Corvallis, Oregon, and um, raised there. His dad was a teamster, uh, not in the union. His dad drove horses, and he dragged logs out of the woods of Oregon. My dad's dad was a, a, a short, wiry Norwegian immigrant. He was a tough, hard scrabble worker, but he was also an abuser and an alcoholic. So my dad didn't learn much about what manhood meant in his growing up years. But he joined the Army when he was 21, and he, he went to uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma to be a part of a tank maintenance battalion. He was a mechanic, and, and very mechanical. I still have grease under my fingernails from being around him. And there he, he practiced his skill, but the most important thing that my dad received while he was at Fort Sill was there were about six or seven men in this battalion who were devoted followers of Jesus. They happened to be members of a group called Plymouth Brethren. It's a smaller sect, uh, a Protestant organization, a biblical organization. They're, they're kind of the, one of their keys to their, uh, their church is they don't believe in a paid clergy. So I disagree with them about that. <laughs> But they, but they were kind of like the navigators before the navigators were ever thought of. They, they, they got a hold of my dad. They taught him how to read the Scripture. They grounded him in a faith that he already had but didn't understand. They taught him how to memorize Scripture. They taught him how to give his testimony, how to teach and preach, how to sing. They, they, they lit him up. I mean, it put him alive, and the smile you saw on his face, that came from the inside out. Life began to happen. My dad's real name is Wilbur. But in the army, they started calling him Tommy, so that was his name for the rest of his life. Tommy Thompson lit up because these men introduced him to the love of God. Now, one of the things that was happening was that there was a, one of the soldiers had his wife there, and, and Margaret was a vivacious conversationalist, and one day my dad was talking to Margaret, and, and he said, Margaret, it's too bad you don't have a sister. And she said, oh, but I do. Well, where is she? Well, she's back in Brooklyn, New York. So my dad said he began to write her letters. And being a patriot, she had to write him back, right? So they began to exchange letters, and that became a daily letter back and forth. So my parents met on the Internet. <laughs> really slow Internet. They did this for over a year, never had met. So my dad was being shipped out to France to go win the war, you know, at the end. And he was in New York, and six days after they met, they were engaged. He went and won the war and came back, and two years later, they were married. I'm the one son of that marriage. I have two sisters. But I'm a product of a home and a father who sang a love song to the Lord his entire life. Lessons he taught me that are too innumerable to mention. He had hardship. My mom was killed by a drunk driver when my dad was 59. I thought he was really old at the time. I don't think that anymore. <laughs> he began a second life. He married again. He was widowed a second time. He knew some hardship. We were really raised in a lot of austerity. Uh, very frugal home, but we knew a lot of joy and music and laughter. But the greatest legacy that my dad has left to me is the legacy of a man who burned from the inside out and never burned out. Why is it that some believers burn brightly, they burn warmly, they, they burn clearly for a lifetime, and others seem to grow colder and weaker and fade? It was because my dad had this huge because in his life. I love the Lord because of all he did. My father got fathered by the Lord himself. And my dad got reparented by other men who knew the Lord and many subsequent to his army days. And so these two things that were part of his life can be a part of your life as well. I want them to be a part of my life. Look what it says in verse 12, it says, with what shall, I render, what shall I render to the Lord for all His benefits to me? This is not a payback. This is not some kind of scrambling, trying to keep my love for God. No, this is the effervescent joy of I've been so loved, how can I express it? 
So number one, verse 13, is humble gratitude. I will lift up the cup of salvation. This is all about grace. My dad was a pastor, but long after he had finished pastoring, he was still discovering grace. Never thought he had read enough about it. Never thought he had had mastered it. Never thought that he knew enough that he could stop learning about grace. He was the hungriest man I've ever met to be under the grace of God. To know it again, to be refreshed and refreshed in it again today, to bask in that. You know, Garrison Keeler has a make-believe town. My dad had a make-believe house. It was called the Tar Paper Shack, and he wrote a little, it would have been a blog if he'd ever been on the computer, but it was a little newsletter he sent called the Tar Paper Shack. And that's a symbol of being simple on the outside and lavish on the inside. And we have a rock that sits on our porch, and one of the things he wrote for the Tar Paper Shack was this. It's called My Front Porch. Far from being a waste of time, it will be for a time of enlightenment, refreshment, and enjoyment. Some of the time we'll just sit on the porch and look at the evening sky. No talking, no activity, except the activity of the heart and the mind. We'll just meditate. We'll delight in the law of the Lord. We'll meditate on that grand idea of how God could love us. To be loved, we agree, is the greatest concept in the world. That was the story of my dad's life, but it's not unique to him. It's unique to every Christ follower who has this huge because in her life or his life. I love the Lord because. I will lift up the cup of salvation, justification. I've been bought and put into a new family, and my dad never got over that. And there's a second quality of his life which can be a part of your life and mine in verse 14. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. It was joyful obedience. I never met a man hungrier to be given a noble assignment. Lord, give me a noble assignment. My dad used to say, we're going to get this done or die in the attempt. And that went from car repair to missions. Because he had such exuberant joy, it spilled on everybody who was within splashing distance. And it wasn't payback to God, it was just a vow. A vow is voluntary. I never met a man hungrier for dominion. Not only in his mechanical life, he was kind of a ready, fire, aim kind of a guy. We had a lot of things to fix. But we sure had fun. But it was also about his ready responsiveness. Lord, when you speak, I'm ready to go. I got to see that from a front row seat. I see it in people around me. This exuberant and generous spirit that spills out on everyone, this eager sanctification. A grateful spirit of salvation and justification and an eager obedience towards sanctification. How do we know what love is? God shows us what love is. And when we know it and recognize it, when we receive it, we begin to respond to it, and it changes our life for a lifetime. I can't think of a better way to end our service this morning than to point to our baptistry, to call our worship team out, and for us to witness some new verses being written in this song of love to the Lord. As these individuals come and say with their lives, Lord, I lift up the cup of salvation to you and thank you in gratitude, and Lord, I'm ready to live a life that pleases you. Let's watch.